We are just a little bit early here, so I'll keep letting people kind of funnel in, but I just started sharing this on Facebook here, so we might as well go ahead and just get started. It is 5.30. Welcome to everyone in attendance. We've got a, a large crowd tonight from all over. We've got some people from Mexico tuning in, saying hi, and um, we're expecting a really good conversation about warm season cover crops. We're going to really dive into some of the characteristics that make up uh, specifically warm season for this webinar. We have on our panel, we've got Keith Burns and Brett Peshek, and they'll be kind of giving our, our presentation. Um, before we get started, just want to again go over the rules. I know this is kind of monotonous, but we do have quite a few new attendees today. So just want to let you guys know you are all muted, but you can go ahead and ask your questions in the chat. And Dale is on, he'll be answering some of those while we're um, talking, but if you've got some, you can also type them in the Q&A and we'll try to answer those at the end of the, present, the presentation. Um, we'll go for about half hour, 45 minutes and then open it up to your guys' questions. So with that, um, I guess, Keith, you kind of want to go ahead and maybe talk a little bit about why we're covering warm season cover crops, if that's not already obvious, based on Brett's 102 yeah. Oklahoma weather. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, even though it snowed two weeks ago in Oklahoma, there's been a lot of warm season stuff planted down there. So, uh, you know, we're kind of, we're, we're in that transitional time now where it's, it's really almost too late to plant a lot of the cool season things. Um, especially from Nebraska South, uh, Nebraska North, you can still probably get some of that done. Uh, but a lot of it has switched over to be uh, using the warm season species, the sorghums and the millets and the cowpeas and, and et cetera. So we thought it would be good just to kind of go through and, and just kind of go through all of the different uh, warm season species. Uh, so what we're gonna do, I've, I've got a PowerPoint here uh, with some different pictures and slides. Uh, I'm just going to talk about the different warm season species that we use and that we put into mixes. And then uh, uh, Brett, Brett's going to chime in and I'll, I'll throw him a question once in a while. He'll, he'll talk a little bit more about how he sees them applied, how he's using them, uh, not only in Oklahoma and Texas where he's got a lot of his customer base, but he, he grew up uh, here in Nebraska. So he's got a pretty good understanding uh, of how these things would apply here as well. So. I am going to share my screen here and Brett, what screen are you seeing of mine? I see you. Oh. <laughs> All right, hold on. Surely, surely not everybody's going to have to stare at me and my beard. And... There we go. That's better. <laughs> We're seeing your desktop now. Okay. Are you seeing the slideshow or the... Yep. No, no. it's on now. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so we're gonna start out with just talking about the legumes um, and then we'll get into grasses and then we'll talk about the broadleaf plants. But, uh, you know, when it comes to legumes, there's some really good warm season legumes that we have to choose from out there. Um, not as many as within the grasses category, but you, you can't talk about warm season legumes without starting with cowpeas because it, it's probably the number one thing that we use. Gone through a lot of cowpeas already. I think we'll be sold out of cowpeas uh, in the first part of June, which is the earliest we ever have. Part of it's because there's a shortage of cowpeas. They had some real production issues down in the south. Uh, the other part of it is there is uh, just a bigger demand. And so cowpeas, exact same thing as a black eyed pea. If you've ever been to a restaurant, you've ordered black eyed peas, you have eaten cowpeas. It's the same thing. We use old varieties though. The, the newer varieties that have been bred for human consumption tend to have larger seed we like the real old ones. In fact, if you go back in the yearbook of agriculture from 100 years ago, uh, you can find lots of great articles talking about putting up cowpea hay, and they'll talk about red rippers, they'll talk about Chinese reds, they'll talk about iron and clay cowpeas. So these are some really old 
I guess you could call them heirloom or heritage type varieties, but we continue to use them because they really work well. They're exceptionally heat and drought tolerant. Uh, they're very good nitrogen fixers. You can hay them, you can graze them. Uh, they, they don't grow back really well. So in a, if you want to do a multiple hay cut situation, you'll get really good growth in the first cutting, but not so much in the second. Uh, and you do need to make sure with all these legumes, like any legume, you need to put the appropriate inoculant on. So for cow peas, you need peanut type inoculant. Uh, so make sure that you're getting that on when you put these cow peas in. So uh, Brad, I think I'm gonna just talk about all the warm season legumes and then you can just kind of weigh in on how you would use the different ones. So, uh, so we don't run out of time. I think I'm just gonna kind of go through all these and then we can kind of jump back and compare them a little bit. So kind of similar to cow peas is a mung bean. And when I say similar, they're similar because the, the, again, they're very heat tolerant, they're very drought tolerant, they're very good nitrogen fixers. The biggest difference between a cow pea and a mung bean is, is how determinant they are. And let me just go back to cow peas here for, for a second. I, I don't have it on the slide here, but cow peas are, especially these old ones, the, the newer ones are much more determinant. These old ones are very indeterminate. And what that means is that they just grow and they grow and they grow. And even though they may be flowering and even though they may be putting on some seed pods, they'll continue to grow, they'll continue to flower. Uh, so being indeterminate like that, they make a really good cover crop because they grow for very long periods of time and you can accumulate lots of vegetative growth. Mung beans are more determinate. They have been bred more for the human consumption market. Uh, if you've ever eaten bean sprouts on a salad bar, you've eaten mung beans because most all bean sprouts on a salad bar are coming from mung beans. And so they're smaller seed size. They're about 8,000 seeds per pound. A lot of your cow peas are going to be around 5,000 seeds per pound. They're going to be a little shorter season. So if you've got a really long period of time for a warm season legume to grow, cow peas probably a better choice. If you've got a little tighter window, you know, you've only got that 60 to 75, 80 days, a mung bean will be just fine in there. We, a lot of times we'll put them together because they use the same type of inoculant. They use that peanut strain of inoculant as well. Uh, you can hay them. Uh, they're not going to be as good as a cow pea because they just don't give you as much biomass growth if you have a long period of time to grow. Uh, but they're excellent grazing and uh, we put them in a lot of our mixes uh, for that reason. Uh, soybeans are another good warm season legume. Everybody's familiar with soybeans as a cash crop. And, and as a cover crop, it, it's not a great cover crop if you have soybeans as a very regular part of your cash crop rotation. If that's the case, go with something else. But if you're not growing soybeans in your cash crop rotation, it's a great cover crop. They're probably the, the least expensive of any of the warm season legumes. Uh, but when you do a soybean, and, and we just do non-GMO soybeans, mainly because we don't have to uh, deal with any um, patent issues and, and uh, any of the royalties and stuff like that. But what we like to go with is, is you want to go with something at least two maturity groups longer than what you would normally use in your area for grain production. And the reason is, is again, we want these cover crops to grow vegetatively as long as possible. So here in Nebraska, you know, we prob we're probably an average of a group three. So we would like to use something like a group five soybean or higher, five, six, or seven as a cover crop, ideally. Uh, down in Brett's area, they're probably doing group fives for grain production. So a group six or seven would be better there. And again, you know, soybeans, they can be hay, they can be grazed. A lot of people don't think of them in that way, uh, but they can certainly do that. Now we have one type of soybean called the Laredo soybean, Again, it's a really old one. It's a small black seeded soybean. And from our understanding is that's actually the first soybeans that were brought into this country from, from China, I think. One of the good things we've gotten from China. <clears throat> but they were brought into this country and then all of our other soybeans were actually bred up from that Laredo soybean. But we still have that. Uh, it's more of a viney vegetative soybean. It doesn't have nearly as good as seed yields. Uh, and it's a fairly long season one as well. So if you're interested in one of those, you can use that. I would like to pitch in a little bit on the Laredos versus your regular soybeans. Yeah. Um, because of the breeding uh, out of just regular non-GMO soybeans versus Laredos, I have noticed more heat tolerance and uh, insect tolerance with the Laredos. And I think that has a lot to do with the tannins in the seed. Uh, and the tannins in the plant, and you'll notice on some of these plants, 
And some of these seeds, there'll be light colored seeds and there'll be dark colored seeds. Typically your darker seeded legumes have more tannins in them. So with the black seeded soybeans, there's more tannins in that plant. And what's happening is you're getting more resistance for, to or for heat tolerance and insect tolerance as well. It does limit palatability on the grazing side a little bit, but you also don't have to worry about bloat near as much. Yeah. Uh, with those. And, and they, you know, the Laredo's are quite a bit more expensive, but again, the seed size is significantly less. So, you know, on a dollars per acre basis, it's probably not a whole lot different if you start looking at, at the seed size comparison there. Uh, and then sun hemp, you know, sun hemp, 10 years ago, hardly anybody ever heard of sun hemp, uh, but now it's becoming very popular. First of all, it is not a cannabis type hemp. It is, is a, it's in the hemp family, but it's a crotillaria species, not a cannabis species. So <clears throat> it's, it's legal to grow, I think just about everywhere except Mississippi and possibly Arkansas have, uh, and, and the reason you can't grow them there is because they have some other crotillaria species that are on the noxious weeds list and they just listed all crotillaria on there. So that's that's unfortunate. We're trying to work on getting that change, but uh, it's a tropical plant. It's very fast growing. It'll get, it'll get six feet tall in about 60 days if it's growing in a lot of heat. Very, very heat tolerant. Probably not as drought tolerant. I don't think it's as, as drought tolerant as cow peas or a mung bean, but every bit as much heat tolerant. Uh, it is a little more expensive than some of the other ones, but again, it has a smaller seed size and the seeding rate on it is lower. So again, on a, on a cost per acre basis, it's, it's similar. Uh, you do need to manage it because if it gets too, uh, too mature on you, uh, it is a hemp and, and that outside skin of that plant can get really fibrous and it can kind of be a little rope or a little string that will wind up on things. Typically, it's not a problem if you're only putting a few pounds per acre in your mix, uh, but if you're doing solid seeded sun hemp, uh, then you're going to want to make sure that you have a good plan for terminating that stuff. Uh, otherwise, it can cause issues the next year. Can be grazed. Uh, there, there is some concern about uh, alkaloids in, and this is just a, a variety, not stated type of sun hemp. Uh, we are working in a couple different countries. We're working with some growers in Africa and also in India. Uh, to try to get a variety called Tropic Sun grown. Tropic Sun was developed by the USDA back in the 70s. And it's a very low alkaloid, very highly palatable type sun hemp. Um, so we will get that sucker figured out and we will have sun, uh, Tropic Sun to sell at some point in time. Uh, it's just, it's hard enough to grow a crop here in Nebraska, but when you're trying to do it remotely through about three other companies, uh, in Zambia, it's it's exceptionally difficult. And so we've had a couple years of crop failures, uh, but we're hopeful we're gonna continue to push forward getting that uh, sun hemp that we know is gonna be a little better for grazing. And then guar, guar beans, again, it's it's one that not many people have heard of. We've used quite a, few, quite a bit of guar in the last four or five years, probably the most drought tolerant legume that you'll ever find. I mean, they grow this sucker in West Texas as a dry land crop, it's, it's that drought tolerant. It has, it, it has the ability to, when it runs out of moisture, that it will just stop growing and it will just, it'll just sit there and it'll wait for some rain. Uh, so because of that, it's very drought tolerant. It does pretty well on sandy soils. It's not going to have near as much forage production potential as compared to cow peas, uh, but it can be a really good fit in there. And one of the things that we've noticed about it, it's really excellent as a winter stockpile graze because those beans, and you can see the picture of the beans there on that stock, they stay in the pods and those, in those uh, they stay on the stock throughout the winter so that for winter grazing, the cattle can actually come in and harvest some of that without having to, you know, pick it up off the ground. So uh, that, that's, that's one reason we, we like the guar. It's not going to get nearly as tall. So if you're putting it with a whole bunch of really tall stuff, it may tend to kind of get shaded out a little bit. Uh, but in the really dry environments and climates, uh, it's a really nice fit. And then, Brad, I think I have one more here, and then uh, we'll throw it over to you. The, the last one I just want to talk about, you don't th usually think about clovers as being a warm season legume species, but this Hubam sweet clover, um, you would want to plant it before now, but it is the most heat tolerant clover I've ever seen. Uh, it's an annual sweet clover, so you can plant this in the spring, and it will bloom in the late summer and the early fall. 
Uh, it's, it doesn't have a lot of frost or cold tolerance, but it's got a really good heat tolerance. It's, it's a great for honeybees. Uh, the bee guys really, really like it because it blooms so late in the season and it blooms for a really long time. And this stuff will get five or six feet tall. Uh, it just ha has a wonderful, wonderful uh, smell to it. Uh, and it, it's probably not the greatest grazing thing, but as part of a mix, again, it, it can be uh, kind of a nice addition. So, Brett, why don't you talk a little bit about how, how you like to use these warm season legumes in your mixes down there? Yeah, so a lot of the, a lot of the mixes that we work on down here are focused on grazing and how, how different species uh, graze. Um, I use all these species all in different scenarios. Um, I will add one to the guar heath that uh, for the one of the most heat tolerant plants uh, a fun fact is Pakistan is the number one exporter of guar so if you want heat tolerance and drought tolerance that's a pretty good indicator yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, the one thing about guar uh, on that uh, it's not super palatable in the summer I've had a lot of people say that if it gets hay or dried down uh, or frost kill, then it becomes much more palatable. I'm not sure why cattle walk through it. I've seen the same thing in my plots in the summertime. It could be lush, green, it could be the last thing green out there and they'll still, still walk through it. So we're not quite sure why uh, animals, it could be tannins, um, but as soon as it frosts, uh, the cattle graze it very well, or even just a couple hours of drying. Um, guard those bean pods, have similar uh, nutrient value as grain, corn, and fields, so really high energy. Uh, I love it in the stockpile mix, especially on lighter soils. Heavier clays, uh, guar just doesn't really do near as well for us. Um, you just want to kind of scroll backwards in your PowerPoint, Keith. Okay, and then sun hemp on the grazing side, uh, again, yes, it's not super palatable. Uh, we use it here in, in southwest Oklahoma, one to two pounds the acre. I have not had sun hemp drought out, uh, but being a tropical plant, it definitely uses the moisture out of your soil profile. So if you are going back to a wheat crop or a fall crop, that may be a concern of, of using too much moisture uh, in it. So we, we try to manage that, we keep it minimal. We usually don't go over two to three pounds the acre of a sun hemp crop just for that reason, because it will take a frost to kill it. And, uh, and we don't want to use too much moisture, but uh, it's a very good component in there. Uh, the cowpeas is number one, uh, probably in Oklahoma for, for grazing legumes. Uh, a lot of people have used it for hay here. Uh, again, the cowpeas, uh, uh, are variable in tannins. So your black eyed peas, you'll notice on the human consumption market have been bred to be white, white peas or white with a little black uh, on them. And so those are low tannin varieties uh, because the human digestive tract is a simple gut uh, and we can't handle tannins near as much as, as livestock. You would get more palatability if you used a, a regular black eyed pea um, but you would also run below the risk. And so that's why I do like the, the Red Rippers, Iron Clays, these older varieties, because you don't run the below the risk in a grazing mix because of that. Mung beans are super palatable, uh, probably one of the top wildlife for deer tracting. Uh, they are more palatable than, than soybeans. Uh, for livestock, I've noticed they'll, they'll hit those first. And I think it's because they hit an early maturity, their sugar content comes up higher sooner than most other species out there. And so I like using all of these in these mixes. Uh, one, to stagger water usage, having different maturity species out there, even though that they may fill similar roles, maturities can play a difference in building drought tolerance into a mix, um, but also staggering your bricks or your sugar content out there for maximum summer gains on stalker cattle. So. Uh, having that diversity in your legumes is, is real key. Uh, on the Hubam, I would say, yes, it's, uh, we grow it down here. Uh, I would definitely have it planted before May in the southern states. Uh, it's one that will tolerate a frost, so we typically plant it in January, February down here. It can be planted well into early April, uh, but once you start getting after close to your 
frost free days, uh, we start leaving it out just because there's more and better species. But yes, it, it once it gets established before that, I like to have four weeks of establishment before we get into our frost free days on Hubam and uh, it, won't, uh, it won't drought out either. Yeah. Okay, well good. So let's move into the grasses because there's there's a ton of warm season grasses uh, options out there. Um, you know, one of the ones that people don't usually think about uh, is corn. Uh, you know, there's a lot of corn grown, <clears throat> but but we have a BMR grazing corn. There's a number of different BMR grazing corns out there. Uh, the BMR stands for brown midrib. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into the sorghum traits. <clears throat> But it's a, it's a gene when the breeders can get it to express itself. It, it codes for less lignin in the stock. And so this BMR corn has less lignin in the stock and it's very, very palatable. And I know that when we've had it in our grazing plots and we've turned the cows out, they'll go and they'll eat this corn down to the ground before they'll go uh, eat the, the even the BMR sorghum. So it's just very, very palatable, uh, highly digestible. The ones that we carry, they're, they're non-GMO and they're short season. And the, we like the short season ones because they fit really well as, as, a, as a swing crop or a double crop because I can either plant them a little earlier in the summer because they will tolerate much colder soils and cooler temperatures than what sorghum does. They're not gonna survive a lot of frost, but you can certainly get them in in about 10 degree colder soils than what sorghum can be. So you can get this in sooner or you can do it on the back end of the summer because again, uh, sorghum needs really warm evenings where corn can still grow quite well with cooler evenings. So uh, it's an open, you know, we, we have one that's an open pollinated. We have one that's an F2 of a hybrid. So they're both very uh, economical. Uh, we have a lot of guys using them for silage or for grazing. And, and another big benefit is there's no prussic acid concerns uh, with the corn like there is with the sorghum. Now, the one big drawback is that it is not going to grow back. So it's from a grazing standpoint, it's one and done. Uh, so you want to let it grow up to kind of the maximum amount that you're going to get there and then graze it down and then you move on to something else. But again, with that, with that short season window, that can still fit pretty well. And then we move into the warm season grasses. And I kind of got some tables here because there's a lot of, there's a lot of comparisons that we need to do. So there's kind of three different uh, sorghum families, if you will, or three different families within the sorghum tribe. We've got sedan grass and you've got forage sorghum and then you got the cross between the two, which is the sorghum sedan. So I'm just going to kind of briefly go through the characteristics of each of them uh, and then we can talk a little bit about where or why they'd be used. So sedan grass is a very fine stem, very leafy uh, product. It regrows very well after a hay or a grazing. It tends to be lower in sugar, but probably a little higher in protein than some of the sorghums are. Uh, most of them are open pollinated, like just the, the old uh, old school Piper sedan is, a, is an open pollinated sedan grass. There are some hybrids out on the market. They're not as popular as the sorghum sedan hybrid crosses, simply because they don't, they, they don't yield as much. Uh, but we've, we've seen some pretty nice hybrid sedan grasses as well. And they do have some prussic acid, but it's pretty low. So you can kind of manage around that. You still would have to be concerned about it, but it's certainly gonna be very low uh, as compared to like a forage sorghum. And so as we get into the forage sorghums, uh, these are gonna be much coarser stem, much larger diameter stocks. They're not gonna have nearly as good a regrowth. They'll regrow some, and especially depending on when you graze them, uh, they can regrow okay, but, but they're not gonna be the ones that you're choosing if you're going to do uh, you know, a, a highly managed grazing situation where you want to graze and then get regrowth. They're very high in sugar and uh, you know, some of these forage sorghums are used to make molasses and used to make sugar. You know, sorghum sugar is, is a very popular uh, and that's because they're, these products can be very high in sugar, uh, very high tonnage potential. These things can get really tall, uh, have really good, they'll, they'll yield every bit as good as a lot of silage corns will in a silage situation. And so for that reason, they're often grown as silage uh, or a stockpile type graze situation. And these do have high prussic acid. So if you're gonna graze a forage sorghum, you have to really manage around that because there's, there's pretty good prussic acid potential there. And then of course the sorghum sedan cross is it's kind of the best of both worlds, if you will. The stem size, it varies based on population. I've seen sorghum sedan uh, that has very small stems like, like sedan grass, 
if you plant really high populations. And I've seen sorghum sedan that has very large stocks like, sor like a forage sorghum if you plant very low populations. So you can kind of vary that based on, on how thick you plant it. Uh, very good yield, very good regrowth. It, it has a lot of good hybrid vigor from the crosses between that sedan grass and that sorghum, bringing out the best traits of the parents. Uh, it has good sugar, it has moderate protein, uh, high yield potential. And this is the one that you would really want to use if you're going to do uh, haying off of it, or this is typically the one we'd use if we're doing grazing. Uh, for a winter stockpile situation, uh, we sometimes we'll use sorghum sitting on, sometimes we'll use forage sorghum. Brett can kind of address that here in a little bit. It uh, kind of depends on your scenario there. And, and they would have moderate prussic acid. You certainly have to be concerned. They're not as uh, high of prussic acid as forage sorghum, but certainly higher than sedan grass. So it's something that has to be managed. And then, and then we get into a lot of uh, different uh, options when you come to these because there's there's basically six different traits that can be bred into these different things and when I say traits it, these are non GMO traits there, there's no GMO sorghums so you don't have to worry about that but these are traits these are genes that get turned on and off by conventional plant breeding techniques so I just want to go through these traits because depending on the family that you choose and then the trait that you choose uh, you can kind of really get the right one to fit the situation that you want. So the first trait is what we call photoperiod sensitive or PPS. Uh, and that's a gene that when they can get that to express itself and don't ask me how this happens, but when that gene is present in the plant, that plant will not start the reproductive process until there's 12 hours and 20 minutes of daylight left. So for a lot of us, it depends on where you are north to south, but for a lot of people that's going to get you into to the middle of September, maybe even the third week of September. So these things grow a long, long time before they ever think about going reproductive. And because of that, uh, they'll get, they can get really tall, but they're very drought tolerant, very stress tolerant, very water efficient because they're not thinking about reproduction until late in the season. And I've got some pictures later on here of how tall these things can get. But this is a really good choice if you've got a long period of time for something to grow and you're not sure that you can get in there and harvest it, uh, a photoperiod sensitive one is really good. Uh, male sterile is a little different. It will make a head, but it doesn't self-pollinate itself. So it's not gonna make viable grain unless it gets pollen from another sorghum source. So you would not wanna plant a male sterile sorghum along with a regular sorghum in the same field if you're trying to prevent grain production because it will pollinate, it will accept pollen from other sources but if it's the only sorghum around, it will, it'll put a head on, but it won't form grain. And because of that, the, the, the plants, when they get more mature, they retain that sugar in the stock since the grain is not being formed. And so for that reason, we really like these maple sterile ones for a stockpile situation where we're gonna be grazing that late in the season or even into the winter, because we'd much rather have that sugar uh, in the stocks than in grain that can fall on the ground and kind of get lost. Uh, so these, these are excellent for winter stockpile grazing. That, that's kind of the main place where we would use these. And then delayed maturity. So these, these three traits all have to do with kind of how long it grows before it, it goes reproductive. Delayed maturity is, is just simply, it's a longer season version of a normal type. So you may see, uh, for example, we have a super sugar and a super sugar DM. Well, the DM just stands for delayed maturity. And that just simply means it's gonna grow an extra three, four weeks before it goes reproductive. It's not photoperiod sensitive. It's just a delayed maturity or a long maturity version of the same type of plant. And then there's three traits that really have to do with the, with the quality uh, of the plant. And the first one, I, I referenced it when I was talking about the corn and that's the brown midrib or the BMR. And that's a gene in there that codes for less lignin in the stock. And when you have a BMR, you have greater digestibility and palatability. I, I like to talk about, you know, think of an apple versus a celery. You know, celery has a lot of lignin in it and apple doesn't have very much, which would you rather eat? Most of us would rather eat an apple and so would most livestock. And so the BMRs are just simply gonna be more digestible. It's a great choice for hay. It's a great choice for grazing. One thing to consider though, is they won't stand in the winter as long because they don't have lignin, as much lignin in the stock. They don't have as much stock strength. So they do tend to break over 
and go down a little bit more. So that's that's something to consider there as well. Uh, dry stock, uh, the dry stock trait is, is just when that, that plant does not have quite as much juice in the stock. Doesn't mean it's less nutritious. It doesn't mean it's less palatable. It's just not as juicy, if you will. Uh, and the, the, the main thing that we would want this for is if you're putting up hay, it's just going to dry out a little bit faster in that windrow. And so we like the dry stocks, like the Sweet Six dry stock uh, is kind of our go-to variety that we like for putting up hay because we know it's going to, the number one, it grows very fast and yields very well, but it's also going to dry out just a little bit quicker in that windrow as well. And then the Brachytic Dwarf trait. Uh, Brachytic dwarf is a natural trait in plants uh, that re results in shortened internodes. So basically, it means your leaves are closer together and you have less stock there. So you have a higher leaf to stock ratio, which is good for uh, palatability and forage quality because there's, there's typically better feed value in a leaf than in a stock. And, and typically, we also see better leaf retention because those leaf collars with, with the shorting, shortening of the internodes those leaf collars really wrap around that stalk really, really well. And so those leaves tend to hang on and uh, stay on that plant better. And so again, for that reason, we really like that dwarf trait for better standability, especially into the winter. Not only does the plant stand better because it's not as tall, but the leaves stay on better, which is really important if you're wanting to stockpile graze that. So you've got the three different families and you got the six different traits and you put all of those together and there's literally hundreds of different sorghum products out on the market. It can be kind of confusing and hard to sort through, but they're all going to fall into one of these families and one of these traits. Um, I've got some pictures here, but Brett, why don't you go ahead and just, I know we're kind of starting to run on time here. So just real yeah. briefly kind of talk about how you like using these. Okay. Yeah, um, so we do both grazing and stockpile mixes for, for uh, summer grazing and winter grazing. Um, the one big difference that I like to differentiate between the species is on the forage sorghums, typically your leaf collar wraps all the way around the stem. That makes a big difference on stockpiling quality into the winter time frame versus a sorghum sedan uh, where that leaf is just attached, uh, just tiny. At, at the stem and so uh, after first frost uh, on a tall sorghum sedan like a like a photo period sensitive um, those leaves tend to shred off in the winter time a lot faster where the forage sorghum holds much better uh, in the into that winter stockpile. Uh, the other thing that I would like to say that on the on the BMR corn the benefit of planting uh, for the same reason of benefiting on planting early, we can plant BMR corn later into the year because those nights start cooling off uh, versus a sorghum sedan. So when it starts getting into August, September timeframe, depending where you're at, located at in the country, um, we can put in that BMR corn and get a lot of biomass there, dry matter, especially if you're planting like a triticale or a wheat for early fall grazing putting those warm seasons in there in that fall time frame can increase your dry matter content to minimize your hay usage on that green lush wheat in the early fall. Uh, the, there's a good comment on here that Jim Johnson uh, put on there. On the male sterols, Johnson grass can pollinate that uh, on those sorghum sedans. It is a relative and can pollinate uh, the male sterols. However, most of the time, the Johnson grass in the road ditches are already pollinated and seeded out uh, compared to when we're planting, say, a male sterile after wheat harvest or graze out wheat, um, as long as they're not freshly mowed and stuff like that. Most of the time, Johnson grass is already seeded out uh, uh, or made ahead to where it's not pollinating that male sterile. Um, but that's something to kind of keep in the back of your mind if you absolutely can't have any grain production out there. A photo period sensitive may be a better option. Yeah. Yep. Good. No, I appreciate that. Uh, here's just a picture of a brown midrib. And, and, you know, if something is a brown midrib, you can, you can, it, it is an actual brown midrib right down the middle of that leaf. So it's a pretty distinctive trait uh, that you can see on there. So if you get a BMR type, you can, you can look at that and you can see that. Uh, here's just a couple pictures. Actually, Dale Strickler shared these 
uh, with us for tonight, but it's just showing a, a plot of BMR uh, sorghum and then conventional sorghum. Look at where all the cattle are. <laughs> they, they can go into either one of those uh, paddocks there, uh, but they're where the, uh, the BMR is because it's just that much more palatable. And then here's the same field uh, after 10 days of grazing. You can see that they've got that BMR strip almost down to the nubbins, but yet there's still quite a few animals uh, there. There's a few that have moved over to the conventional. Uh, if you're gonna graze, it's worth a few extra bucks an acre to do the BMR. If you're not gonna graze, don't spend the extra money, just get the conventional. They'll, they'll give you just as much biomass out there, uh, but for grazing, the BMRs are really nice. And uh, Keith, Keith, can I add a little bit more onto that dwarf? Uh, with that grazing, I know that we have a lot of uh, viewers that are looking at rotational grazing. The it, if moisture is an option or you, you're pretty consistent on moisture, the, the value of the dwarf sorghum on rotational grazing is, is much higher than the others. And the reason for that, it allows the animal to bite off that seed head and that plant tillers out and you get much, much more leaves uh, if you can bite that seed head off. And that tends to be uh, one of the bigger problems with your photoperiod sensitive or your regular sorghum sedans is that seed head gets up above where the livestock can't reach and bite that seed off, seed head off to where that plant doesn't tiller out. So your, your dwarf sorghum sedans uh, don't get as high. It allows that animal to bite that seed head off and keep tillering out. It will actually produce more beef per acre on a rotational system than your other sorghum sedans yeah. because of that capability. Yeah. And, and Brett, you bring up a good point too that I, I meant to mention and I didn't. You, you're not limited to just one trait. So like we yeah. have varieties like the dwarf ones are also BMR. Mm -hmm. So you can stack these traits in uh, on top of each other and, and get, so the really the best products may have two or even some of them may, may even have three of these traits uh, that really give it natural fits into uh, grazing situations. Uh, here's just another, uh, I think this is the um, gain comparison on those previous slides that we looked at. Uh, the animals on the BMR sorghum sedan were gaining 2.8 pounds a day, where on the conventional sorghum sedan, 1.8 pounds. So uh, there's just no doubt that it's worth the extra bucks an acre uh, to get the ones with the BMR trait because it, the performance will certainly reflect uh, that quality and that digestibility. Um, here's a picture. This is uh, this is Dale Strickler. I think this was shortly after his NBA career ended because Dale is you know, about six foot eight tall. So that makes that sorghum there about twenty feet tall. <laughs> but uh, now, you know, it's it's just a picture to show that photoperiod sensitive plants can get really really tall. Like Brett was saying, you know, if you were going to graze that stuff there, you would have wanted to been out there, you know, when it was about at Dale's head you know, not that high up. So it doesn't always get that tall, but it certainly can, especially in the longer season areas, because uh, it just grows and grows and grows and it doesn't go reproductive because of that photo period sensitive trait. But one of the things that, that does is it gives it really good water use efficiency. So here's a study from Texas A&M uh, showing that the photo period sensitive plants put on 2.5 tons of, of biomass per inch of irrigated water whereas your hay grazers and BMRs and non-BMRs were all very similar, but yet notice how much better all of them are than corn. So that photoperiod sensitive sorghum is almost three times better than corn at water efficiency. Uh, so just think about that, you know, when you're, when you're starting to think about maybe I'm in a water limited area, or maybe I don't want to spend the money pumping that irrigation water and I'm just growing forage. Uh, you know, consider some of these forage sorghums or sorghum sedans and then, you know, consider the traits um, because they can really have good benefits there. We did talk about prussic acid some, and I just want to kind of hit on this. Um, just some rules of thumb with prussic acid, you know, don't graze sorghum when it's less than 80, 18 inches tall because that young regrowth is potentially high in the, in the prussic acid. Rotational grazing makes management easier. Don't graze if there's a risk of a frost because the frost will concentrate that prussic acid in the plant tissue. Uh, once it has dried out after it's frozen down, uh, you, can, you can go out there and graze it then because that dissipates uh, in the same way with hay. You know, hay is safe to use. Uh, there's no prussic acid uh, issues there when it's been well cured. So 
Prussic acid is something to be concerned about. It's not something to scare you off. Uh, it's just a, it's just another management thing that you have to do when you're using uh, things out of the sorghum family. Keith, I'd have one other thing to add to that. I would add killing frost into that. Uh, as we move south, uh, more often than not, we'll see a time where we'll get a frost in October and we'll get back up to 90 degrees in the south and we'll actually get regrowth uh, and tillers off of sorghum sedans and yeah. forage sorghums. And keep in mind, sorghums are a perennial that typically winter kill. If you're really far south and into Mexico, they may overwinter. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you again, it's just something to be aware of. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of millets out there too. And again, I just want to kind of go through this quickly. There's, there's about five different millet families that I want to talk about. Pearl millet is, is most of them are produced as hybrids because they're the, they're going to be by far the most expensive, uh, mostly because of the hybrid seed production process, but they're also the most productive. They're going to give you the most tonnage. They're going to give you the longest period of growth before they'll go reproductive or put on a seed head. They've got good regrowth and some of these other traits that we talked about. Uh, there are some BMR pearl millet types out there. There's not very many and they're quite expensive, but, but they're quite good. And so pearl millet is probably the one that you'd want to go with if you're really doing the high intensity grazing and want to try to capture maximum gain. And especially if you don't think that you can get in there uh, at quite as quick because these other millets are all going to be shorter season than the pearl millet. And pearl millet is shorter season than a lot of the sorghums, but some of these other millets are really quite short season. So then you kind of go into the German or the foxtail family. Uh, they're fast growing, but again, they have a shorter season. They're excellent for hay, uh, but they need to be harvested in a timely manner. Otherwise, they'll, they'll put start, start putting that seed head on, and then the, the hay quality goes down, and your regrowth will really go backwards. They've got, they've got okay regrowth. It's not as good as most of the other ones. Um, and, and there's a couple types. There's Golden German, and then there's also uh, the one that we actually like better. Is, well, it's called White Wonder. Uh, it's a white seeded uh, foxtail millet versus the German is as more of a yellow uh, seeded. But the, the white wonder, uh, we think, has a little better growth. Uh, it just gets a little taller and has a little bit more biomass potential out there. Brown top millet is another one. It's kind of in that same family, but I grouped it separately because we talk about it differently a lot. It's a really good millet for the south because it tolerates humidity better typically. A lot of this is grown in the southeast where it's very hot, very humid, and it tends to hold its palatability longer. So it's a better fit into winter stockpile grazing. Most millets don't hold their forage value nearly as well as sorghums do. So we don't use very many millets. If you're telling us, hey, we want to graze this in November and December, uh, you know, we'll go with sorghums and the BMR corn and things like that. But the brown top probably does hold its palatability and nutritional content better than the other millets uh, going into that winter stockpile. Japanese millet, very tolerant of wet soils. This stuff will even grow in standing water. So if you've got some flooded out wet type holes, uh, the Jap millet is probably the way to go there. It, it's probably one of the shortest season millets. It does mature pretty rapidly, but it does have good regrowth. So if you're grazing it or haying it off, it will kind of come back. And then proso millet uh, is a grain type millet. It's harvested for bird seed. Uh, it doesn't have a great forage value. Uh, it's the least forage value of all the millets. It is very water efficient. It's very short season. Uh, you know, guys out west can grow this in a pretty short time frame if they got a little bit of water to work with. It's excellent for bird plots. If you're putting in any uh, cover crop fields and you want to enhance the quail or the pheasants, Throw a couple pounds of proso millet in there. It's really good for them. Um, I've just got a picture here then of all of the all of the different millets. So starting in the top top corner, uh, the one that looks like a cattail, that's the pearl millet. And then the next one over is the brown top millet. And then the proso millet is that real open-headed panicle uh, where the birds can really get in and get to that seed. And then in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, that's the Japanese millet. And then the one kind of in the bottom middle there, that's your foxtail or German or white wonder millet there. So Brett, why don't you just give us a, a word or two on millets here before we have to kind of Yeah, move. you want to scroll back to your previous slide a little bit. 
So on the, on the millets that we use, uh, I would say one thing that I would highlight is if you have really heavy soils, really heavy clays, pearl millet is going to be typically limited on your heavier soils, especially waterlogged soils. It's not going to tolerate waterlogged soils. Uh, typically when we start getting into the heavier clays, I like using species like brown top millet and Japanese millet. Uh, for the value of those, uh, per pound going into a system uh, economically, those two do, do a little better uh, for, the, for the tonnage that you get out of biomass. The one thing that I really like about your foxtails and your brown tops versus the pearl millet is your fine stem seed size. So I typically talk a lot about grazing, but the finer stems uh, millets really make a nice straw for soil coverage especially when you're grazing, they tend to get trampled a little easier. It makes a really nice 100% soil coverage when you're grazing summer mixes versus sorted sedans or burl millet. So I do like throwing those in there. I would say that brown top does kind of act a little bit like crabgrass. Uh, that could be a good thing, that could be a bad thing. So I always, I always pay attention to that in your crop rotation. Uh, brown top millet can reseed itself very well. And most, most of the smaller seeded millets uh, will reseed themselves voluntarily next year. Uh, pearl millet does not produce that much seed, being that it's a hybrid. It may have a few seeds in the seed head, but I hardly ever see any volunteer issues. Yeah, it's hardly ever an issue for volunteer. So, so um, as far as quality wise, I, uh, the brown top, the reason why it's gotten its name is because it senesces from the top down. Uh, that plant will be green as a gourd uh, once it uh, is maturing out and that, that seed head will turn brown. So the benefit of that is if you're getting extra rains and you can't get it hayed or you can't get it grazed, that quality is still there in that leaf. Where most plants on your, especially on your foxtail millets and your Japanese millet, you'll see that plant senesce from the bottom up, uh, but the brown top, that seed head will turn brown before that plant actually turns physically mature uh, and it'll move down down the plant. So that's kind of how it got, has gotten its name um, in its growth pattern. But both, I, I use all these mixes in the South. They all have a place. Uh, I've had uh, 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 really good luck with all of them, so. Okay. Well, I'm going to uh, I'm going to have to skip through a little bit here. Uh, nitrate, um, you know, any of these things that grow can have nitrate issues, uh, but they can be managed, and a lot of it has to do with your stubble height. Um, here's a sample or a, a test from a sorghum sedan plot fertilized to 300 pounds of nitrogen, specifically for this test. They weren't doing that because that's how much they wanted to put on. But when they cut it to two inch stubble height, it tested at 5,900 parts per million. Six inch stubble height was 2,900 parts per million. And when they left 12 inches of stubble, it was only 1,500 parts per million. So the nitrates are gonna be concentrated at the bottom of that plant. So if you're concerned about nitrates, number one, just don't put as much fertility on. Uh, but if you think you've got nitrate issues, uh, just uh, you know, harvest the top part of that plant. Uh, I've just got a few more slides I want to go through real quick. We're not going to talk about these much because these are other things that we typically put in warm season mixes. We don't, you know, brassicas are not a warm season plant, but these have forage collards, these impact forage collards tend to tolerate heat better than any of the other brassicas. So it's the number one thing I'm putting in my warm season mixes from the brassica family, just simply because they've got really good heat tolerance, but they've also got great cold tolerance. Uh, and the palatability is really good. We like sunflowers a lot as well. Deep-rooted, fast-growing. They're actually pretty good grazing uh, is when they're small. And then if you can get those things to form ahead and make some seed, they're really good for winter stockpile grazing because the cattle will eat all those heads and they'll do really well on that those high oil seeds. Safflowers a little bit the same way. The, the seeds in a safflower have high oil content as well. Uh, most safflower is kind of a thistle type, but we have this baldy safflower, which is spineless, uh, more of a smooth leaf like a sunflower. And so it's definitely what you want to use if you want to put safflower in a grazing mix. 
buckwheat, again, not a great forage, but it's great for the soil. It grows very, very fast. It helps free up phosphorus in the soil. Uh, it is, cattle will graze it, but, you know, you, you would just want to keep it at relatively modest qu quantities. You know, two, three, four pounds an acre is plenty uh, in a grazing mix like that, but it's an excellent attractor for pollinators and it blooms very quickly. And then flax is not a good grazing plant at all, but I still like it in a lot of my summer mixes because it's just a tough little plant. It's very highly mycorrhizal, very, very supportive of mycorrhizal populations. Great companion plant with others. It, it plays well with others and it never hardly ever gets choked out and it stands really well. You can see this flax when it's matured, uh, it will stand there all winter long like that. So it can be a really good snow catch crop. And then the last one is okra. Okra is something that we started using as a cover crop about five years ago and we've really increased the amount of okra that we use. Very long lasting residue, very deep rooted, great heat and drought tolerance and it's actually pretty good grazing. The cattle, they'll, they'll eat the fruit and they'll eat the leaves. They typically won't eat the stalk, which is good because if you get some more moisture in growing season, uh, that okra will put on new leaves and it will grow new fruit. It just keeps growing taller and taller. We'll keep flowering up at the top of that plant. And you know, I've seen okra plants that are 10, 12 feet tall if, if they can grow long enough. So uh, again, you know, just another plant that is part of a mix. You wouldn't want to have a whole field of it. Uh, but it's a nice companion mix with a lot of these other things that we've talked about. So, uh, Noah, what do we have for questions? I know that we kind of talked for a long time here. What kind of questions do we have popping up? Yeah, um, well, I've, I'll start here with just a few that were sent to me um, through email, and then I'll continue to go through the chat. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to start typing them out now. Um, the first question here is from Bruce, who has goats, and he says he likes to graze his goats on cover crops. Uh, are there any that are unacceptable for grazing? You want me to answer that, Keith? Yep, go ahead. Uh, so with goats, typically your those animals uh, require a higher broadleaf diet than, say, a cattle scenario. So I tend to lean heavier with broadleafs. Uh, goats need more woodier species to survive and thrive on. Uh, probably the biggest reason why goats get out in a grazing system is it, we spray out the brushy, woody species, and all we have is grass. And so the animals don't like uh high diets of, of pure grass diets so i wouldn't say there's anything that is bad for goats um in, in most summer mixes but i really like sunflowers okra uh those woodier stemier species uh typically they don't touch the millet as much what's that sun hemp sun hemp would be very good in fact we see in the wildlife side that uh, deer have a high preference for sun hemp. So I kind of refer deer, refer deer and goats in a similar diet pattern as uh, uh, for what they require. And so goats typically prefer 80% broadleafs to 20% grasses in their diet. Sheep are about 60, 40, and cattle are anywhere from 30% broadleaves to 70% grasses to 50-50, depending on the animal. Okay. Um, what is the, this is from William, what is the compaction breaking potential of summer covers? Do any species really stand out? <clears throat> well, yeah, the, the sorghum, sorghum sedan is a very deep rooted grass. So it's definitely gonna be your best grass for helping break compaction issues. Uh, and then, of course, sunflower and okra are really deep, that deep taproot. So the combination of the, of the deep fibrous root of the sorghum and the deep taproots of sorghum or of the sunflowers and the okra are really good. And from the legume side, I think sun hemp is probably going to give you the best, deepest rooting system there. So if you're growing after compaction, I would do all those. Throw in a little bit of the, of the daikon radishes, uh, and you got a really pretty good compaction fighting mix. I will say though that if you're going to try to get down to deep compaction, you have to get that planted early. You can't be planting something like that 30 days before frost and expect to have a lot of really good compaction breaking benefits. So 
the sooner you can get it planted, the better, because the root system, uh, by and large, is going to be uh, a direct comparison to how long it grows. So the longer it grows, the more compaction you'll break. Uh, I would add on to that. Uh, this is more of a thought than what I've seen, but I plan to test it. Uh, compaction is more of an oxygen limiting factor for root growth than it is a physical compaction. So uh, perennials like Eastern gamma grass blow through heavy compaction. Uh, and I've talked to Dale a little bit about this and I plan to test this, but I encourage some on-farm testing on your own to try out a little bit. Um, since Japanese millet can tolerate waterlogged soils and grow and thrive in water, uh, me and Dale assume that it has some arenchyma in the roots, which allows oxygen to go down the middle of the root. If that's the case, uh, Japanese millet may be a good component in your mix to survive high compacted soils because of the lack of oxygen. And so I would encourage trying it. Like I said, I don't know that for a fact. We've kind of hypothesized that. Uh, we've had, I've heard several people say that it's done great uh, with that, but I would check into that. And like I said, we're, we're continuing to kind of test that out and observe more on that one. Okay. Uh, this one comes from Facebook. Travis says, for winter stockpiling summer annual forages, when is the optimal planting date for maximum quality? And can you include triticale in that mix for spring grazing? Uh, on the grazing mixes, I wouldn't say that there's, there's an optimal time. It's whatever time that uh, you're dealt with on your grazing system. Uh, we can tweak, there's a lot of species out there that you can tweak it. For instance, if you have uh, uh, a window to where you can only plant in August time frame. Uh, you can use spring species, you can use summer species, and you can use winter species that all stockpile really great um, in, in the August time frame. If you're planting, uh, and I'm, I'm assuming for that area uh, of August, anywhere from North Texas through, through about Nebraska to South Dakota for my region is what I'm kind of referring to on that August time frame. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I would say if you're going to use warm season things in that, you want at least 60 to 75 days before your first frost. Yep, I, I think at 60 to 75 days, you can get a lot of growth out of a warm season plant, but yet you can still get the cool season plants. And like Brett said, the spring cereals will actually give you a lot more growth that time of year. So spring oats, spring barley, spring triticale, and that gives you, <clears throat> those things will grow, you know, well after the frost, and it will give you really high quality early to midwinter grazing. If you want something to overwinter and give you that early spring grazing, then that's when you need to go to the winter triticale, the rye, and things like that. <clears throat> and then those, those are probably best planted probably 45, 30 to 45 days before your first frost is optimum on those. So kind of depends on when you want the grazing and what species you want to put in there as to when that optimum time is. Yep. Yeah, it kind of depends on what your goals too with that. So of what, what animals are you stockpiling? So kind of keep that in mind. If you're stockpiling pigs, you might want things fruiting like uh, sunflowers, uh, grain or forage, sorghum, uh, pumpkins, squash, uh, gourds. If you're doing uh, cattle, then, you know, more fibrous, more protein. What's your limiting food source in the winter time frame and, and address that, so. Okay. Um, this comes from Larry. Is there a rule of best practice to release the cattle on the cover crop that can be measured from plant to maturity for planting purposes, such as 50% of total maturity time? Obviously, species being different, but if there's kind of an average um, would help in designing a mix for that. So when is the best time to put cattle out on a, a warm season mix? Uh, a good rule of thumb that I use is, is uh, need a hip uh, on, on grazing height on sorghums. I tried to avoid going by days because one, where you're at, your, your growing season might be limited. It depends on the species in that mix too, but need a hip has kind of been a good indicator of, of starting point on grazing and rotating on, on that to keep those, those uh, 
species in, in a vegetative enough state uh, uh, to keep rotating around. But uh, as far as days, I've had millets hit maturity with adequate moisture in 40 days. Uh, I've had 11,000 pounds of biomass in 30 days uh, with adequate moisture and good soil health and, and good fertility there. So um, it's hard to say days on something like that. So I kind of, I kind of, what are your goals there soil health wise and grazing wise, you know, if you're trying to maximize residue on the soil surface, you might like those let those species get farther along in maturity to get more lignin, get more uh, woodier species to lay down on that soil surface. Okay. Um, with that, it is 6.30, so we'll probably wrap things up here. Um, if you guys do have any other questions, Brett uh, and Keith, their emails is just the name at Green Cover Seed, so it's Keith at greencoverseed.com and Brett with two T's, B-R-E-T-T -T, at greencoverseed.com. So if you guys have those questions that we either missed or didn't get to, feel free to send them an email um, and they'll gladly follow up with you on that. This uh, will be recorded. I know there's a couple of people asking for the slides. Um, so if you want those, feel free to email Keith. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Um, thank you, Brett and Keith for your knowledge and willingness to share and Dale for answering questions on the side. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Thanks guys. All right. Um, I'll also throw in here before I end next week, we are going to talk about alternative crops to grow other than the typical corn, beans, and wheat. Um, we're going to have kind of a farmer panel on that, talk about the challenges and opportunities that come with growing different um, niche crops. So, would love for you guys to tune in on that. You'll find the sign up on Facebook and in the email that we sent out yesterday. So with that, thank you guys so much and we'll see you next week. Thank you.